put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is a reading of God's word. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Living Faith Community Church. It's great to see you all. So good to see you all here today. Uh, we are continuing our study of First Peter today, and our passage here, especially from verses 4 to 10, is a pivotal passage in the epistle. We need to really place this in its entire context. Uh, God's elect are strangers in the world, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, God the Father chose us, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Jesus redeemed us from our empty ways of life, and the Spirit sanctified us. So there is this Trinitarian work of God electing, Jesus redeeming, and the Holy Spirit sanctifying. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit working together to continue to give us help and salvation in the journey that we have as exiles. That we are to live in the world, but not of the world. And God called us as his elect and holy people, and we are to live as holy. Uh, Peter preached a wonderful sermon last Sunday about being holy, living in the holiness. We are holy because God is holy. It's, it's not that we're holy because, not only because we live a life of holiness, our life of holiness doesn't define us as holy. This is, this is very, very important. But the fact that God is holy and he calls us holy defines us as holy. And our identity is deeply rooted in our relationship with God we serve. In other times and cultures, questions of identity did not have the urgency or the need for regular review in many, many, as, as many experience today. At one time, and still many other cultures around the world, a man or a woman belonged to a certain city and family, a certain social group or community. Uh, today, most of us live far from our homelands and hometowns and families. We don't have extended families living together anymore. At least, that's not the norm of the Western culture. Because people define themselves by their jobs, education, performance, uh, we lose the value of seeing people as who they are. As a result, our identity and our achievements are confused with one another. When things are not going well, you isolate yourself. You isolate yourself from your friends, your groups, your community, and you're all alone 
when things are not going well because people ask questions and you are tired of explaining what's going on in your life because you define yourself by your achievements. And sometimes we define not only ourselves, but others by their achievements. So we let others at the same time define us by our strengths, weaknesses, and accomplishments. So we live with this pressure to perform. And, and, and most of us, especially I think in New York, we, we have this pressure to perform and to achieve. But for Peter, in this passage, identity begins with such questions as, who is my God? Whom do I trust? What is my community? The question, whose am I, has more weight than who am I? This is very, very hard for all of us who live in our culture to grapple with. But for Apostle Paul here, this is the context and we have to understand them. For him, whose am I was more weightier than who am I? First Peter chapter 2 verses 4 says that our faith defines us. This is what Peter is saying. Because Jesus is God's foundation, we are living stones. Because he chose us, we are a chosen race. You see, that's what Peter is saying here. In our context, 1 Peter chapter 2 here, the Apostle Paul calls his church chosen people, people of God, and imputes this new status of New Israel. And we have to understand this in this context of Old Testament as well. Peter assumes this. This is what he's assuming as we understand this. He's assuming that to come to Christ means to come into his community. That's what Peter is thinking here. That's why he is connecting this new group of people who are scattered, they're, they're aliens and strangers, and this multi-ethnic, multi-race community here, and he says, look, you are a new Israel. You're the church. You come to him. As you come to the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you are also like living stones. You're offering sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying here. According to Peter, all that we are rests on all that Jesus is. That's what Peter is thinking here. And I say amen to what Peter is saying here. And then from this, this is what I gather. Follow my logic here. Follow my logic. This is what I'm thinking. My identity is inseparably connected to Christ, my cornerstone. I cannot have my own identity apart from Christ. Because he is my cornerstone. And to be connected to Christ means to be connected to his body, the church. That's what Peter is thinking, and that's what I've concluded, and that's what I'm sharing here. And I don't think this is only my logic, but I think this is what the Apostle Peter is saying. In the Old Covenant, God set his people apart from the nations. In the New Testament, or in the New Covenant, he sets us apart as we live among the nations. In the Old Testament, he says, you are to be separated because you're holy people of Israel. In the New Testament, for us, he says, yes, you are my chosen people, but you live among the nations. All of the scriptures testifies that we cannot be fruitful and we cannot be thriving Christians unless we're joined to his 
family, and community. With this in mind, I want to share two things today, briefly. Just two points. This is very, very, you know, out of ordinary for me to share just two points. But uh, uh, this is what Peter is saying, so I had to stick to what the text teaches. The first point I want to talk about is Christ the cornerstone, and the second point is church the living stone. Remember what I said. My identity is inseparably connected to Christ, my cornerstone. And I cannot have my relationship with Christ apart from my relationship with his church, the family of God. And that's the same for all Christians. We cannot have people who love Jesus who are not connected to church. And we cannot have people who are connected to the church but who are, do not have relations with Jesus. This is a very, very important concept, folks. So Christ the cornerstone. If you look at verse 4 and 5, it says, As you come to him, a living stone, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. Which literally means the house of the Spirit, a temple. I want to make a couple of observations here. First, as you come to him, here means as you draw near to God. It's not talking about this a conversion experience at the altar where you come to him and say you, you change from, uh, you have conversion experience and become from uh, non-Christian to Christianity. That's not what this text is talking about. What this is talking about is as you come to him, he's assuming that these are followers of Jesus, Apostle Peter here, and, and as you approach him in his presence, as you worship him, that's what he's saying, and he's addressing his followers here. As you come to him, as you draw near to him, and as you worship. And in the Old Testament, the temple represented the dwelling and the presence of God. Many of you who've been a Christian for a long time know this. A building itself was a very, very special, it was a sacred part of their spiritual life. They could not experience God's presence apart from this specific building, a temple. So here, it's, it's appropriate, it's right for Peter to say Christ is called a living stone. But it's a daring metaphor, because as you know, stones don't have life. But he says it's, he's a living stone. So the readers here, the first century readers, are automatically making that connection. Okay, this is the building. You have to have the temple to worship God. Without the temple, we can't approach God. As I draw near to this temple, this building, Apostle Peter is saying, this building is Jesus. This temple is Christ. He is the living stone. And Peter is about to quote three Old Testament prophecies to prove his point. And that's what he's doing in this passage that we just read. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord. Are you with me? Thus, therefore, thus says the Lord. Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. This is the Old Testament text. Peter is quoting this. Psalm 118.22 The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Old Testament text, text that Peter is quoting here. And Isaiah 8.18 and he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both house of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. A precious cornerstone, cornerstone rejected by people, a stone of offense to those who do not believe. Old Testament text. These passages about this particular stone, 
You know what these Old Testament people were talking about. This is before Jesus' time. And they're all pointing to this. They had a building in view. They're looking at this building, and they're talking about this particular stone. And all the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. He is a precious stone, rejected by people who do not believe. But for those who believe, he gives a glorious new identity as a people of God. It's the cornerstone that holds the building together. It's the cornerstone. Some call it, call it foundational stone. But for the New Testament and Old Testament and the first century and ancient Near Eastern thinkers here, the cornerstone is not just a foundational stone, but it's the cornerstone that connects everything. And I'm going to show you a picture of this. Uh, you see that? I made, I made a, that's my art work there. I, 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 I should have asked Peter to do it for me, but uh, I was so excited to show you this picture. This is part of a building, you know, and it's supposed to be larger. But that little thing right there, that's the cornerstone that connects the one to the left and to the right. That cornerstone, you take that out, the building collapses. And the concept, that concept was used to build this uh, arch in St. Louis. There's a cornerstone up on the top. You take that out, the whole arch collapses. That's the concept of the cornerstone. Cornerstone. You take that out, the whole thing collapses. It's the cornerstone that holds the entire building. You see. Not the whole laid foundation, but the cornerstone. And that's what Peter is talking about here. And the first century readers immediately got that concept. Oh, that cornerstone. He's the one. He's the one who's holding the temple. He's essentially, supremely, exceptionally important. He's essential. He's the one. And because the temple, Old Testament temple, is the New Testament church, it's Jesus who holds the church together. You see. In the Old Testament, it was the building. New Testament, it is what? People. Old Testament, building. New Testament, people that make up the church. It's Christ who holds the church together. And the question, obviously, as we are being reflective, the obvious question that I ask myself is, is Christ holding this church? Is Christ the cornerstone of this particular church? What's holding our church? Who's holding our church? And if I take this more personally, is Christ holding my life together? Is Christ the cornerstone of my life in existence? Is he the cornerstone of your church and is he the cornerstone of your life? It's particularly interesting because Apostle Paul uses this image and with this stone image. It's particularly interesting because I think Apostle Peter was being very, very self-reflective here. That's my guess. And I think it's pretty accurate. Some of you who've been going to church for a long time might remember Peter was not his original name. What was his name? Peter's name? Simon. Yes. There you go. Simon. Our youth group students. That's good. Peter is so happy back there. So it's, it's Peter's Original name was 
Simon. Uh, when someone, uh, someone does well, we should all congratulate, you know, not, you know, uh, make teachers pet and stuff like that. But uh, anyway, Simon was his name. And Jesus comes to Peter and asks, Hey, who do people say that I am? And Simon says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're right. Upon this, I will build my church, and your name will no longer be Simon, but will be called Peter, which means rock. You're the stone. You're going to be the rock. Of course, there is old Petrine theory that says Jesus built his church on Peter. That's why Peter was the first pope and the church developed. But that's not what Jesus is teaching here. Jesus did not say, upon Peter I will build my church. He says, upon this I will build my church, which which means the confession that Jesus is the Christ and Son of living God. Upon this, but you made this confession on behalf of your friends here, disciples, and your name will no longer be Simon, will be Peter. He was given this name, which means rock, and here Peter says, Jesus is the rock, not me. He's confirming this. Jesus is the rock, and he's saying that by calling him a living stone. Peter is saying it's all about Christ. It's all about Jesus. It is him who is the cornerstone. When Jesus walked on earth, he declared he was the temple. He says, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. He was speaking about himself. He's the rock. He's the temple. The building had become personal. He was the place where God met with his people. God displayed his mercy and grace and his goodness to his people through the real temple, now the person of Jesus Christ. He is the living stone. In Christ, we find the experience and presence of God. And in Christ, we find the joy of belonging to one another. We rejoice in the honor and the ministry of being built together. We don't have church apart from Christ. We can't grow in Christ apart from His church. Like I said, We can't love Jesus without being committed to his church. And that's what Peter is teaching here. And thus, he goes on, and there goes my second point, church the living stone. I want to start with asking these questions here in this section. What's your view of the church? What's your view of the church? Why are you involved in the church? Why do you go to church? I'm going to say something very bold. Hang on tight. And don't hate me for this. I suspect that your view of the church is too small. Because I know that my view of the church was, and sometimes still is, too small. Just think about why we go to church. For some, church is nothing more than what we grew up doing. It's our tradition. I always went to church. I'm supposed to go to church. Why? Because I grew up in the church. My parents told me I had to go to church, and I go to church. Some parents go to church because they think it's good for their children to grow up with. Yeah, it's good. 
good to have church family for my children. It's good. It's as good as being in other clubs, like chess club or whatever. Church is good. Maybe you go to church to get a weekly pep talk and sing some nice songs to get you motivated for the coming week. Yeah, I need to go to church. It's been hard, so I got to go and got to get motivated. But the thing is, our preacher is not that motivational. So you're thinking about maybe I should go to other churches that give you motivational talk. Others go to church because they fear that if they don't, some bad things will happen in the week. If I don't go to church on Sunday, oh, I don't know. A lot of people are getting laid off at work. I should start going to church. It's possible that you attend church because of these wonderful relationships you have. And some of you might like the teaching. This this is healthy. That's why we go to church. I have all the friends in the church, community. These are all great things. I'm not saying they're wrong things. They're all good reasons. But in essence... In essence, we can boil down these reasons down to, I think, two words. I can use many words, but two words. Consumerism and individualism. That's why we constantly were thinking, what did I get out of this service? What did I get out of it? Hey, pastor, my child didn't get anything out of this. It's not worth my money. I didn't get anything out of this. We ask, is it worth my time and money and effort to go through all this? Would it be better to just watch a nice movie and get inspired? If we ever think this way, we have a wrong or much smaller view of the church than what it actually is. Why do you go to church? Why are you here today? This is a lot of work. I wonder about your view of church. Mine as well. This is what Peter is saying. Peter described the church as a new temple of God built on the foundation of Jesus. Jesus was sent for the church. Jesus came for the church and he did everything he did. Being rejected, scorned, dying on the cross. being condemned by his own Father God and rejected by people for the church. How dare we take church to side? The whole story of the Old Testament Israelites being chosen and delivered by God was proof that we are the church, a living temple of God. In other words, the church is not incidental to God's plans. It is central to God's plans. Central. Can't have Christ without his church. He's not given you, the church, to fit your plans and priorities. 
He's given you the church to serve his plans and his priorities. God does not exist to serve us. To fit our priorities and plans and our children's priorities and plans. But we have pushed the life of, in the church aside and made it secondary. This is a sobering, sobering message. Uh, As God chose His Son, Jesus Christ, so He chose you, the church, and all of God's people, whether Jew or Gentile, are one community by faith, and all of you, coming from different backgrounds, one community by faith. We're kingly priests. Royal priesthood is an oxymoron. Royal priesthood. Royal priesthood. Priests represented people. King represented God. So priests would always... You, if, I, if I was a priest, you would always only see my backside like this. Because I'm representing you, and I'm bringing your sins, and I'm bringing your offerings, and I'm bringing your sacrifices, and I'm bringing your blood, and offering to God, and saying, God, please forgive your people. The prayers that these people bring to you, I come to you. That's my job as a priest. But what's interesting is, it says, you're all priests. You're all. But not only common priest, but royal priest. Now, we represent God to others. This is what God is saying. Royal priesthood. People belong to God. And all the descriptions that we see here, chosen race, royal priest, holy nation, people for his own possessions. I'm done. I got to be done. I made promise to myself and Elder Dan that I preach shorter sermon, that, uh, that I, I, I'm done with this. All these things, I'm not going to go through all four. <laughs> I'm constantly looking at Dan's face. It's like, does he think I'm going too long? All right, I'm done with this. Uh, chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, people for his own possessions. This is all it's saying is a people treasured. Treasured people, the church. Why? Because of our connection with Jesus. Jesus is treasured. Does God love Jesus? Is Jesus treasured by his Father? Yes. And because of your connection with Christ and your union, your faith in Christ, so are you. And this is what I want to give you here, and I'll close with this, this little chart. The traits of Jesus, the traits of Jesus' followers. Jesus is a living stone, and you're living stones. That's what Peter is saying, right? He's rejected by humans, saying, so are you, exiles and aliens in this world. In God's eyes, chosen elect. In God's eyes, chosen and elect. In God's eyes, valued, honored. In God's eyes, royal, beloved. That's what you are. Not as individuals. He's not talking about individuals here. He's talking about church as collection. That's why you cannot take yourself out of the church and say, oh, that's not important. I'm more important than this. We can't do that. That's, that's not, that doesn't register in Peter's mind here. And that's not a biblical concept. We're so influenced by this individualism that we always think about my identity. But in the biblical theme, it's ours. 
Maybe I'm too old. But I cannot have an identity of myself apart from my wife and apart from my children. And for now, apart from this church. I'm part of the group. You see. And that's why I can see this and says, living stones, aliens, exiles, God's eyes, chosen elect, God's eyes, royal beloved. And this is what the prayer and, and benediction that Apostle Paul gives in Ephesians. And as we read this, we'll go into the Lord's Supper. Did I give you the Ephesians passage? I didn't give you the Ephesians passage? Okay. I thought I did. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. I was going to make a grand transition and read this and go into Lord's Supper. Yeah. Well, what can you do? That's life. Anticlimactic. 19 to 20. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Christ himself being the cornerstone, we're built upon him. And that's what you're about. 